Hello, hi. Um, we are going to make a start now. Um, obviously, people who are helping themselves to tea and coffee, feel free to, and then make your way to your seats. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I didn't intend to speak uh, myself uh, other than introducing the speakers, but just really quickly a few points. Um, firstly, obviously we have several anniversaries that we're celebrating and marking today, but also one more that I've been, um, I would like to say asked, but probably commanded to mention by um, a dear friend, I'm sure to many of us, um, Francesca Klug, who was intending to be here, but isn't able to in the end. Um, so it is of course 25 years since the Human Rights Act 1998 was passed as well. So she did want us to mention that as well. And obviously it being very much her baby, um, she did want that mentioned. So I think of course it's important that we acknowledge that um, uh, to commemorate that as well. Um, then one more thing, just amongst your handouts, you will have a, a printout on your seats, um, which since, since uh, you know the name has been mentioned already, and we will hear much more about him, obviously René Casson, um, uh, the, the, the drafter um, and the brains behind the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. So what we have here, um, a member of his family will very kindly be joining us for our um, final panel this evening. Um, but what they have found from the family archives is a handwritten first draft of the UDHR um, signed by René Casson himself. So I just thought I would mention that. Um, obviously, we tried to print it as well as we could, but we can email that round as well for anyone who would like to have um, a clearer copy of that. Other than that, let's just move on to our speakers. Um, I think I propose to just introduce them as they're speaking. So our first speaker, um, Lord David Anderson Casey. Uh, Sir, the Right Honourable Lord Anderson of Ipswich, KBEKC. Uh, he is a barrister, cross-party member of the House of Lords. He was the Independent Review of Terror Legislation um, from 2011 to 2017. He's a visiting professor at King's College. He's a judge of the Court of Appeal in Guernsey and Jersey, a council member of Justice, um, Transparency International, other organisations. Um, and this, in fact, I think at some point I would like to ask him about him about, but I saw online, it says he's appeared in 150 cases in the Court of Justice of the EU. So that does seem quite remarkable, 150 cases. Um, so over to you, David. Thank you very much indeed, Shoaib. I'm a great admirer of yours and your efforts with the press, which have already been referred to. Thank you, Kingsley Napley. And good to be among so many friends. I couldn't mention all of them. I can't resist mentioning Jess Simor. She and I have history. Uh, tutoring Hungarian prosecutors in human rights on the great Hungarian plain. Dominic Grieve, without whom I wouldn't even have ever dipped a toe into public life. And oldest friend of all, my former law tutor, Conor Garrity. Yes, folks, he really is that old. <laughs> well, well, I've said my uh, inspiring bit in uh, the booklet. This will be a more workaday start to this session. Um, in fact, looking at the four of us, I, I thought I would run a quiet first leg for an amazing uh, relay team. Um, but all good relay teams, of course, are quick, and I really hope uh, we can uh, achieve that uh, in time for you to ask a few questions. So um, please just jump on me if I run away with myself, which I probably will. Two or three times a year, I attend the Committee of Ministers quarterly human rights meetings, so-called CMDH, at which the ambassadors to the Council of Europe meet to supervise the execution of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. And I appear for the government of Cyprus, um, normally seeking um, enforcement of judgments in interstate cases against Turkey. They're always interesting meetings, but they're secret. So it's sadly not possible to say anything about them, except what you can glean from the published memoranda of the various states and their published decisions. But I thought that amid the celebrations, it would be worth just saying a word about the enforcement of judgments of the court. There are many successes. The CMDH can be a pretty effective organization. States, usually following the lead of the Secretariat, uh, are surprisingly hard on each other. And NGOs can intervene as well, not orally, but in writing. Implementation of the ECHR was the top priority of the Council of Europe's four-year strategic framework, uh, agreed in 2020. Last year, it closed the supervision of the execution of 880 cases, including 200 so-called leading cases, uh, which are cases that reveal new structural or systemic problems. And just a few quick examples, because this is supposed to be an upbeat occasion. Armenia changed its constitution on the state of emergency and on judicial review. Croatia amended its legislation to allow investigations into war crimes. 
uh, back to the 1990s and adopted a new law on missing persons. Greece amended its criminal law to allow investigations into racially mo motivated crime. Turkey's prison administration practice has changed to enhance protection of LGBTI uh, inmates. The UK, uh, as has already been said by Andrew in a different context, is an excellent performer. It's implemented 97% of the judgments and friendly settlements against it since 1975. We even implemented prisoner voting in the end. The main exception has been the McCann group of cases uh, regarding failure to investigate suspicious deaths in the Northern Ireland conflict. And I can't spill any secrets about the, these secret meetings, but every single time we go there, uh, the UK is absolutely hauled over the coals in detail, including all the details of the Northern Ireland uh, Troubles Bill. Um, it is really quite remarkable, the, um, the, the detail that is, uh, is gone into there. But there are systemic problems uh, with compliance with European court rulings. And I'll start briefly with Rule 39, Interim Measures, topical subject. Section 55 of the Illegal Migration Act 2023 notoriously makes uh, UK compliance conditional. Apparently the latest episode in the fashion for using statutes as levers in international negotiations. See also the Internal Market Act, although we got rid of that bit, and uh, the Northern uh, Ireland Protocol Bill. I'm pleased to say that one never saw the light of day either, but it's a, it's a pernicious habit. But it's not just us. Poland has refused this year to obey interim measures requiring the reinstatement of judges. There have been problems in France, Belgium, and other countries. Interim measures are particularly unlikely to be complied with in the rapidly growing number of interstate cases, not only those involving Russia, which of course has now left the Council of Europe. Changes to the procedure are currently circulating in draft, partly in response to concerns expressed by the UK. They include, as far as I can see, disclosure of the identity of the judges who make the decisions, which is one of the UK demands, and a commitment to request representations from the respondent state uh, before making the order save in urgent cases, though so far as I know that is uh, their practice uh, anyway. Perhaps those will meet UK objections, I don't know, it seems pretty sure they won't meet the objections of uh, some others that refuse to comply. As to the execution of final judgments, uh, the numbers are frankly shocking. You heard Andrew Cutting say that there were something over 1100 judgments in total last year. Well, at the start of last year, there were 1300 leading judgments pending implementation and they'd been outstanding for an average time of more than six years. If you look at all judgments pending Im implementation, the number was more than 6,000 overall. According to the European Implementation Network, which tracks these things, 47% of the leading court judgments from the last 10 years have not been implemented. And that includes 37% of leading court judgments from EU countries in the last 10 years have not been implemented. Now, of course, some countries are particularly bad offenders. That's always the easy way out of this one. But this tendency was not limited to the usual suspects. 27 states had 10 or more leading judgments awaiting implementation. Certain types of judgments, such as those requiring investigation and punishment of state perpetrators or measures to attack entrenched discrimination, have especially poor compliance rates. And Alice Donald and Joel Grogan have done some great uh, research to establish that. There have been additions to Article 46 of the ECHR, the implementation article, in force since 2010, but they haven't been very successful. There's a so-called infringement procedure in Article 46.4, uh, uh, which allows uh, the matter to be referred back to the court uh, for the uh, and the court to, to make uh, an order regarding the uh, non-implementation. But the court has taken quite a conservative view of its powers in the two cases that it's heard, Mamadov and Kavala. As far as I know, there's still been no compliance in Kavala, even after that 46.4 ruling. Article 46.3 allows a reference back to the court where there is a problem in interpreting its judgment. This has never been used, largely because it requires two thirds of the total number of states to vote for a reference in the Committee of Ministers. And experience suggests, at least to me, that it is difficult to achieve that number of states to vote on almost any issue. Many states are preferring to sit out the votes rather than take sides and take the diplomatic flag. So we have a major problem on our hands. I'm not a historian uh, of this issue, perhaps I should be, but I sometimes wonder whether compliance rates were higher when significant numbers of member states were aspiring to join the EU and therefore had that incentive uh, to be good uh, international citizens. Um, and perhaps that has changed now that so many have already joined uh, or, and, and others such as Turkey um, have given up hope of joining. Maybe their incentive to comply has diminished. 
Well, briefly and finally, uh, what is to be done about this? Uh, I couldn't see much in the Reykjavik Declaration this spring about that. There's lots of the usual pieties about outreach, contacts, guidance documents, interinstitutional cooperation, legal education, dialogue with civil society. They're all great things. I'm afraid I can't see any of them being enough to solve this problem. Alice Donald again and Philip Leach. And let's take a moment just to salute Philip for the astonishing work he's done over many years in taking and winning cases against Turkey, against Russia and against other former um, Soviet countries. Uh, they've made some suggestions and I'd just like to, 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 to uh, summarize three of those. The first one's a great idea. Why don't they live stream the CMDH? I can tell you it's pretty dramatic at times. Last time I was there, there were Azerbaijan and there were Armenia and there was the military operation and they pretty much had to react on the spot. It would have been great television in either of those uh, countries. And um, perhaps it would have not only provided a bit of transparency, uh, but um, meant there was some political and reputational cost in those countries for non-compliance. You could even require the attendance of ministers or senior officials for the same reason. And sometimes they do come voluntarily. Or you could think about graduated sanctions for persisted, uh, persistent non-compliance. We already have options which have been viewed as nuclear options, suspension of voting rights in the assembly, ultimately, of course, uh, termination of membership. Should we start to think about suspension of voting rights as a penalty for sustained and persistent uh, non-implementation? What about daily fines for persistent non-implementation? That was uh, proposed by the Parliamentary Assembly as long ago as 2000. But member states have never been able to agree it. Even, uh, and here we really are thinking outside the box, what about the imposition of EU uh, sanctions, in particular for Article 18 violations, which Robert Spano has described as indicat indicators of the retrogression of inclusive uh, liberal democracy. Perhaps that will be the sort of uh, complementarity and coherence of action uh, between the Council of Europe and the EU uh, that was urged by the high level reflection group of the uh, Council of Europe. Finally, I'll just mention one thing which I only know about because I sat next to Lord Keane in a committee meeting, but he's a member of the Parliamentary Assembly, and he recently published a report proposing a structured mediation process to support the role of the court in interstate cases uh, by assisting in promoting friendly settlements before a case is brought or following a merits ruling. Seems to me uh, a good idea as well. But that's enough from me. I think, uh, Jonah, over to you. Thank you so much, David. Um, our second speaker is Shauna Jolly Casey. She is a barrister at Cloisters, head of the Human Rights Practice Group and the International Practice Group there. She has wide ranging um, experience in international law, including in respect of the UN Special Procedures. Uh, her most recent success, of course, was acting for the South African athlete Casta Semenya in her European Court of Human Rights case against Switzerland. Um, Shauna was Bar, chair of the Bar Human Rights Committee from 2019 to 21. She is a visiting professor at Goldsmiths University, and she has just recently been appointed academic visitor at Hartford College, Oxford, and the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights. Thank you, Shana. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shoaib, to the Human Rights Law Association and uh, to Kingsley Napley. It's a great pleasure to be here with many friends in person again, uh, and on this panel with uh, uh, many friends and colleagues. Um, it, it, it's a funny week to be talking about human rights because of everything we've seen in the press in the last uh, week or so, uh, particularly. Uh, and the question of whether or not we're going to uh, leave the convention is pretty much firmly back in the political mix. Um, obviously, there are, uh, there's another time and a place for talking about the consequences of that and what it might look like. But I want to think about the question of what would replace a treaty of such constitutional significance. Uh, now, the answer to looking for that has been pretty much unreachable over the last decade. And any replacement that we have now would have to contend with the complexity, the scale of cross-border challenges, which all legal systems now have to grapple with, uh, for better or for worse. Climate change, AI, accountability of supranational organizations to name but a few. The world around us is becoming more complex, not less. Playing our part in the international order and its frameworks mean that we can't live in an isolated legal vacuum either. Uh, international rules and laws govern so many parts of our lives invisibly. And the convention has done that too. 
generations now growing up, not even realising that rights they take for granted have been grappled with, developed and assured through the Strasbourg court, and indeed many of those just over the last 20 years or so. The living instrument role of the convention is a critical part of the uh, law, uh, law's dynamic, keeping it relevant for modern day life, which is changing at unfathomable speed. And so this afternoon, I wanted to say a few words in support of the living instrument doctrine. In some places, it's criticised as the enabling device for judicial activism, for a mission towards rights creep. And perhaps on another occasion, I'll say more about that. But for now, I want to think about in response, who should the convention and the court serve? Is it a forum for the protection of individual rights or is it a forum for states to just feel safe? Those of you in this room will be able to easily think back to cases in which, I'm not suggesting that all of you were around at this time, but to cases in which the living instrument was relied on, the present day conditions to challenge practices which we now consider straightforwardly wrong or harmful, corporal punishment in, in Tyra, I think 1978, a whole stream of cases con uh, concerning sexuality, gender, or the way in which society views the concept of family. All of these have changed enormously. Marx and Belgium, in other cases, soon after Tyra, uh, which was talking about legitimate and illegitimate children, something one would struggle with today. Um, Dudgeon, of course, in the United Kingdom, homosexuality and everything that followed that. There's many, many other areas in which this is applicable. The law evolves and needs to evolve as our lives change and as our societies change. And the court has, uh, for better or worse, tried to reflect that dynamic. Sometimes we criticize it for being too cautious, for being too conservative, but it has to remain relevant. And so the court is now turning its attention to many of the very big issues that I talked about a mo moment ago. AI, um, uh, I'm going to talk if I've got a, a moment about the case of Glukin and Russia, which is a really interesting case about the way that the court is now grappling with um, technology and the complexity of technology. Got climate cases, I see Jess in front of me. Uh, the climate case is being deliberated. Um, my client, Casta Semenya's case, which is in fact going to the Grand Chamber, if you didn't know, so that there's going to be another hearing on that next year. Um, and the impact, of course, that that case has not just on that individual client, but on the class of athletes and sports people across Council of Europe countries as well. I'll take a minute, if I may, just to talk about Glukin, because I think it's a really good example of the living instrument in practice and a really good example of how the court manages to get right the balance between rights which were created to reflect all time effectively and incredibly real modern challenges that no one could have thought about when the, when the court and the convention were created. Um, and Glukin, if you haven't read it, is a case uh, uh, involving Russia, and it, it concerned facial recognition technology, sometimes called live technology. Uh, it, it's got the aim of recognising a person by its face, and so you can imagine that it's incredibly valuable for law enforcement agencies. It's able to recognise faces in large crowds. Um, and the applicant in that case brought an Article 8 and an Article 10 claim. Um, he had been uh, raising a banner, effectively, the facts of that case where he, he raised a kind of protest placard uh, where he had, uh, I think he said about a specific politician, you must be effing kidding me, I'm Konstantin Kotov, I'm facing up to five years in prison for peaceful protests, and that's what his banner stated. And there were various photographs of that protest. It was in Moscow, sorry, it was a one-person protest. Um, and photographs of that protest were taken on social media. They were distributed, screenshotted, and added to a police database. And then those photographs were used in conjunction with face recognition technology and CCTV surveillance footage to identify the applicant as the man who'd staged the protest. Uh, and then subsequently, live face, facial recognition technology was used to identify his whereabouts in order to arrest him. And the court's reasoning is really very interesting on this. Um, and it, it's, it's an Article 8 and an Article 10 case, but there are similarities between the way technology is considered in this case and other areas. Um, 
and um, Raza might be talking about some matters where this is similar. Um, the court had absolutely no doubt that the use of this technology, which involves storing and processing applicants' personal uh, data, including his biometric data, did engage Article 8. And the fact that this was a public protest, so the public nature of the protest, didn't exclude the application of Article 8. Um, and so the court had a very interesting analysis of <laughs> Article 8 protection, saying it didn't exclude activities uh, taking place in a public context. It's not limited to an inner circle in which the individual may live his or her own personal life without any outside interference, but also encompasses the right to lead a private social life. In other words, establishing and developing relationships with others in the world around him. The, I'm going to cut forward because of time, but I, I wanted to tell you specifically what it said about the technology, which it recognized as being useful and efficient for law enforcement. But it said, and I quote, the protection afforded by Article 8 of the convention would be unacceptably weakened if the use of modern scientific techniques in the criminal justice system were allowed at any cost and without careful, carefully balancing the potential benefits of the extensive use of such techniques uh, against important private life interests. And then on top of that, the court recognized that the context of the use of this, what it termed highly intrusive technology related to the applicant's peaceful uh, protest in respect of his political opinion. So the court accepted that whilst uh, the fight against crime and particularly organized crime and terrorism depends to a great extent on modern scientific techniques of investigation and identification, nevertheless, there were limits and um, uh, there, were, there were breaches of both Article 8 and 10. And one of the things that I found very interesting about that judgment uh, was also the emphasis by the court on um, a report by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, that's also something actually, um, it, 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 it has been quite commonly used UN reports within some of the really interesting new areas that are developing because the court's of course interested in looking more broadly at the international position. Um, and of course, Glukin, which maybe we'll talk about later has various relevant implications for life in the UK. So just in conclusion, one of the things I wanted to say uh, as a positive as we mark these anniversaries today, and as we recognize the environment in which we mark these anniversaries. Britain, in my view, continues to play a very positive role in the convention's development. British judges, British lawyers, arguments emanating from our courts influence, influencing the case, court's case law. I remember saying that exact thing about the European Court of Justice. Shut it out. And we've not only got to find and create new systems for ourselves, but we get shut out of the ability to influence important decision making. Um, and so just in final, I'd just like to say that these important anniversaries are a very good time for Britain to renew its political commitment to international law as a force for good. We don't need to look to history for the lessons of the past. The present shows us we must stand together and forge a path forwards. And in that, I'm going to remain cautiously an optimist. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Shauna. Um, our third speaker is Raza Hussein Casey. He's a barrister at Matrix, where he's a founder member. He's appeared in over 30 cases in the Supreme Court and House of Lords and regularly appears before the European courts. Um, in 2013, he was listed among the top 100 silks practicing in the UK, and he won Silk of the Year at the Legal 500 Bar Awards this year. Um, but of course, most importantly, um, he was leading a legal team that defeated Priti Patel and Suela Braverman at the Supreme Court in the Rwanda case last week. So we're delighted to um, thank you very much, Shoe Ben HRLA, for inviting me to speak, Kingsley Napley, uh, particularly in such august company and on such an august occasion. Um, I wasn't sure what to talk about, but Shoe persuaded me to take you through a whistle stop ECHR article by article tour of some of the cases I've been involved in over the last couple of decades. I'll also mention a couple of cases. Uh, on the right declared in Article 14 UDHR, the right to seek and enjoy asylum from persecution, which I think has now crystallized 
into a right to be granted it, at least contingently so, in the absence of a safe third country. More on that later. See, for example, Article 18 of the EU Charter. This was always a distinction between enjoying and being granted asylum. It was always a distinction that was, in, in Lauterpuck's words, artificial to the point of flippancy. And then I'll end with a few words on the Rwanda case. So here goes, Article 1 and 2, extraterritorial jurisdiction. Al Skaney concerned a hotel receptionist from Basra Baha Musa, seized, detained, beaten to death by British soldiers. House laws held at the British military facility was within UK's extraterritorial jurisdiction, but other killings in British-occupied southern Iraq weren't, a conclusion which the ECHR, uh, European Court of Human Rights, overturned on the basis of the UK's exercise of effective control and authority over the applicant's deceased relatives and its assumption of authority and responsibility for security in southern Iraq. This triggered a duty to investigate those deaths, which led to a public inquiry and a scheme of independent investigation I had. al Jeddah. this case concerned the question of whether Article 5 protections were displaced by the effect of a UN Security Council resolution uh, 1546 to permit, so as to permit internment and preventative detention. The, the European Court having found jurisdiction, having found that the applicant's detention was retributable to the UK, said no. Smith in the House of Lords concerned the death by heat stroke of a British solicitor deployed again in Iraq House Lords drew a line in the sand, held that while Article, uh, literally so, while Article 1 jurisdiction was established when the soldier was on the military base, it wasn't when he wasn't. And this conclusion was reversed following al Skaney al Jeddah in the Grand Chamber. Uh, in, I think, Perkins, as Jess reminded me, and the subsequent case. It was Jess's case. I was for the intervener. Uh, my claim to fame was that I was junior to the great uh, Michael Beloff. Al Sadoun uh, concerned uh, the transfer by the UK uh, from the UK detention facilities to Ir the Iraqi authorities of two applicants, senior Ba'athists, where they risked the death penalty for murder in breach of a Rule 39 indication, topical again. The court found Article 1 jurisdiction uh, that having regard to Protocol 6, Protocol 13, transfer would breach Article 3 because the death penalty amounted to IDT, the human degrading treatment, and that the UK had breached its Article 13 and 34 obligations by failing to respect the uh, Rule 39 measure. Article 3, some Dublin cases, NS in the um, Court of Justice uh, considered the EU Charter analogue of Article 3, Article 4, and held that despite principles of mutual trust and confidence, that a Dublin return of an asylum seeker to uh, Greece was barred because of system breakdown giving rise to Article 4 risks in Greece, Article 3, ECHR. Uh, Supreme Court, Ia Meritrea, uh, concerned Dublin removal to uh, Italy. The court interpreted NS uh, in line with orthodox serving tests, reading down the systemic breakdown requirement. Tarakel, Grand Chamber, Strasbourg Court concerned Dublin remo removals to Italy. Article 3, destitution. Limbuela, uh, House laws held that the statutory regime, which prevented asylum seekers from working and denied them access to benefits, meant that the negative obligation in Article 3 was engaged uh, because the regime amounted to treatment following the earlier Q case. So the denial of shelter, food, basic necessities uh, with the imminent possibility of suffering amounted to Article 3 ill treatment. Case is also notable for its rejection of law justice laws is spectrum analysis. Talk about that later if you want. Um, Article 3 and humanitarian protection, the status uh, derived from EU law, a case called MP Sri Lanka. Uh, claimants suffered severe mental health problems because of uh, PTSD, severe depression, following his torture in Sri Lanka. The issue was whether, as a health case, uh, he, he, he was deprived of this EU subsidiary protection status. The case went to uh, the Luxembourg court, which said, no, it, 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 he hadn't been deprived of that status. Article four, uh, prohibition of slavery, servitude, false compulsory labor extended, of course, in Rancev, as Parosha said, to include human trafficking in MS. The Supreme Court held that the article four obligation to investigate a case of forced labor, human trafficking, meant that the claimant could not be removed until the investigation had been completed. Some Article 5 cases, most famously Belmarsh, A and others, House laws held that the indefinite detention of suspected foreign terrorists violated Article 5 and 14 
wasn't justified by the exigencies of the situation under Article 15, pursuant to which the UK had derogated from Article 5, in circumstances where there was no equivalent provision for homegrown British terrorists. This is a very important case on discrimination and the vice of under-inclusivity. Uh, Lord Bingham holding that it wasn't the measure the indefinite detention that need to be justified under the discrimination analysis, but the difference in treatment. Very, very important case. Article 5 control order cases, the regime that succeeded uh, the ATSA, the Belmarsh regime, cases of DD, MB, House Lords held that an 18-hour house arrest lockup for suspected international terrorists violated Article 5 uh, uh, and imposed a cut-off, everything else being equal, of 16 hours. A couple of words on two common law cases, Lumba, Kambadzi, false imprisonment. I mentioned them because they built on an earlier Court of Appeal case called D in the Home Office, where Lord Justice Brooke had held uh, that it was Article 5.5, the provision of the convention giving rise, to, uh, guaranteeing an enforceable right to compensation for a violation of, of Article 5, a unique provision in the convention. Uh, it was that that had reinvigorated the tort in Lord Justice Brooks' words, in D, Lumba, Kambadzi, the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court held that any public law breach bearing upon the leg legality of detention sounded in false imprisonment, rejecting earlier case law that required demonstration of preanismic uh, jurisdictional error. Article 6, Ottman, uh, the European Court held that expulsion of Abu Qatada to face trial where the evidence uh, against him had been in part obtained by torture amounted to a flagrant violation of Article 6, a very high uh, threshold, the case that Connor referred to. AF, control orders again, House laws held that, that a disclosure of the gist was required in open proceedings. Article 8, immigration removal and family life, Huang, the House laws held that immigration rules were the starting point not the presumptive end point of the analysis subject to exceptionality, and it was for the tribunal to make its own mind up on the Article 8 question. Uh, Lord Bingham distinguished the approach from that taken in the housing context by reference inter alia to the fact, very importantly, that immigra immigrants do not enjoy the franchise so that it was very unlikely that the legislation or the immigration rules would have struck the proper balance. E.M. Lebanon, House Lords held that the expulsion of a mother and child to Lebanon, where the child would, would be uh, placed by force of local law in the custody of an abusive father, amounted to a flagrant violation of Article 8. I think the first case where that's ever been held, a flagrant violation of Article 8 in this context. Um, Article 10, Farrakhan, Nike, Lord Carlisle, con all concerned exclusions from the UK of individuals who sought to come here and exercise rights of speech, and in particular rights of political speech, uh, the courts upheld the Secretary of State's assessment that these individuals should be excluded on the basis of risk to, to public disorder or in the Lord Carlisle case on the basis of retaliation by a third state. Courts held that those assessments attracted deference and upheld uh, the exclusions, as I said, though over time it's very clear, Lord Carlisle in particular, uh, the narrowing of the margin uh, uh, available to the Secretary of State. That's my whistle-stop tour of the ECHR. Right to asylum. Right to asylum, two cases, H.J. Iran and R.T. Zimbabwe. Supreme Court held in both cases that it was not an answer. Jess will remember she did a fantastic intervention in H.J. Supreme Court held that it was not an answer to a refugee claim that the claimant would suppress on a prudential basis a characteristic protected by the Refugee Convention to avoid persecution. H.J., uh, that was the, the uh, sexual identity in R.T., it was the right not to hold a political opinion, really important right in a pluralistic society. The 51 Refugee Convention, of course, was agreed in the aftermath of one totalitarian regime and before another. It was uh, agreed in the same year as Hannah Arendt's work uh, on the origins of totalitarianism was published. Uh, and it is, of course, a defining feature of totalitarian regimes that they do not recognize pluralism, they don't recognize the right not to have an opinion. And that, that recognition played out, I think, in the gay uh, uh, discrimination, the, in the case about discrimination, the, the, the cake case, the gay discrimination cake case. These cases, uh, uh, H.J., Iran, R.T., Zimbabwe, reversed decades of uh, Court of Appeal case law. 
that had held that as long as the individual, in order to avoid persecution, would themselves suppress their protected identity, then that was a complete answer uh, to the case. As the Secretary of State put it, Charles Bourne, as he then was, this was, this would have, this was, if we were right, this was, this was would turn refugee law on its head. Well, it seems to have done. Last um, uh, uh, thing I'll um, end on then, Rwanda. Two features of the Supreme Court judgment, which I think stand out. What one that I was discussing with uh, um, David Ansom just now, with Ansom. First, framing. So the Supreme Court held non refoulement to be a quote unquote core principle of international law, not simply derivable from Article 3 ECHR, but also um, uh, contained in the Refugee Convention, obviously the Convention Against Torture, ICCPR Article 6 and 7, as interpreted by the Human Rights Committee, and also probably CIL, Customary International Law. That wasn't an issue in the case because the only issue was Article 3. We'd framed it that way because it was the cleanest way to argue it. Uh, uh, the, the, the court says that because it wasn't argued, they weren't going to reach a conclusive view on whether or not this was CIL or not. Um, I think it's very clear that it is CIL. Um, the UK has recognized that as the court uh, itself noted. The real dispute is whether non refoulement is just cogens. If you're, you, you, you'll be aware that international law essentially has a tripartite structure, just cogens at the apex, custom, very important at the next level, very important because it's not dependent on treaty, a source of common law, absence any statutory provision to the contrary or any constitutional reason for not receiving that in, in common law, it forms a part of common law. It's pretty clear to me that, it, that non refoulement is a part of common law, let alone uh, it, it, um, all the statutory, pregnant in and contained in all the statutory provisions to which the uh, court referred. Um, so that's really important. Jus Cogens, Lauterpach and Beth Bethlehem have said it's uh, Jus Cogens, as recently, very recently, Swiss Federal Office, I think, said the same thing. Tom Hickman, that fantastic public lawyer, innovative, fantastic public lawyer, has written a brilliant article on this issue as well in the London Review of Books before. Uh, the judgment, in fact. Second thing that stands out is the court's affirmation of its role in reviewing assurances. The Secretary of State's view, essentially adopted, uh, accepted by the Divisional Court, was that assurances were a panacea, a magic bullet, complete answer to the problem, and that her assessment, not only of the good faith of Rwanda in agreeing to these assurances, but also as regards their deliverability, attracted tremendous deference to the point that you had to have quote unquote compelling evidence to gain say that. The Supreme Court rejects all of that. Unsurprisingly, I'd suggest, given that what, what you had there, what you have in Rwanda at the moment, obviously there's a talk of treaty, but what you had was a non-binding, non-enforceable agreement that uh, supposedly transformed the curial role um, in assessing whether or not a binding, enforceable, uh, multilateral treaty obligation would be complied with in circumstances where that non-binding agreement was intended to secure compliance. It was a very odd uh, uh, submission that was, with respect, uh, accepted essentially uh, by the Divisional Court. I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Raza. Um, I, I do have to say, I mean, like Raza said, um, we had agreed on a visit to stop tour of the ECHR in 10 minutes. But to be honest, I meant that more as an impossible challenge that he would <laughs> give up on midway through preparation. But yeah, it's amazing to see it actually happen. Thank you so much. Um, our uh, final um, brilliant speaker on this panel is Baroness Chakrabarti CB. She is a member of the House of Lords and a barrister. She was Director of Liberty from 20, 2003 to 2016 and Shadow Attorney General um, from 2016 to 2020. She's a visiting professor uh, at the LSE and a Master of the Bench of Middle Temple. Um, she was one of the pa panel members of the Levitin Inquiry and a former Chancellor of the University of Essex. In 2005, BBC4 ran a poll who, which eventually placed her in the shortlist of 10 people who may run Britain. Not guilty, uh, not guilty. <laughs> so Thank we are you. very privileged to have you.
Thank you so much. Um, and it's an it's 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 a huge privilege and pleasure to 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 be here um in such distinguished company, but mostly um amongst such good friends in difficult times. Um, I'm going to try and compress my comments because I'm really worried that you've all been sitting there and and these are panel discussions, but you've not had the opportunity yet to to, to um, contribute and and, and and time is pressing. There's another panel and and more to follow still. I want to echo some of the more optimistic um, remarks that have been made because we need we, we need a little optimism, I think, in in these in these um, very uh, difficult um times um i sometimes struggle to find that optimism myself but but i do i do find it and so i want to try and share some of the glimmers of optimism that i have found with all of you for the last few years i've been working plug plug uh, uh, on on my third book for penguin it's not a law book it's not an academic book it's a, it's a trade book for non lawyers for politically interested non lawyers it will come out in the spring hopefully before a general election um and it's and it's called human rights the case for the defense and the ambition is a 200 odd page book for, as I say, politically interested lay people, very much inspired by the late great Tom Bingham's book, uh, the, the Rule of Law, and what he hoped for, for that book. I hope to some extent for, for this book, but, but not for the rule of law, uh, but for, 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 for human rights. And in the last few years of reading for that book, and of course, you have to do a lot of reading to to produce a little bit a little bit uh, uh, of writing i've been fascinating sometimes challenged uh, often inspired by um, academic lawyers in in particular from around the world um supporters and skeptics from left and right uh of politics and i and i do see in that sphere a real burgeoning of, of, of thinking about, about what human rights mean at, at this stage in the 21st century. And whilst I really celebrate that some of the history that we've touched on, and, and we'll touch on a tiny bit myself, I think we also now need to build on that and think about our human rights frameworks very much in the face of the challenges that we and the world face in this shrinking, interconnected planet on fire in the 21st century. And I think Shona gave us a very, very good little nudge in that direction, because I am going to argue um, in the book in 200 pages and with you in two minutes that we actually need more global governance and internationalism, not less, just in practical terms, not even philosophically, um, but in practical terms, we just need as humans on this planet more global governance and internationalism to face the challenges that are in our face and secondly that the key to the whole human rights kingdom then now and in the future is equal treatment the key to the kingdom and, and Raza touched on this towards the end of his remarks but I think you will find um, my view having re read and reread all the big all the treaties mm -hmm. and older pre-World War II uh, national instruments, going back to you know the US declaration, the French declaration and onwards, the key to the kingdom is always equal treatment. And opponent, opponents of human rights um, uh, take the opposite view. So they want less internationalism, notionally at least. They, so they, they, they want more nationalism, except on the Learjet. And in the first class lounge and on the Learjet where no where, the, where no passport is required because the American Express diamond card will do, thank you very much, right? When they're all mates selling weapons to each other and, and being chums with each other, then then they're very happy with their version of internationalism or, or globalization. But um but notionally, when they're whipping up from Olympus, when they're whipping up uh, people on the ground into a frenzy to hate each other and fight each other, then they're then they're notionally nationalistic. So that's one problem with the that's one argument that the opponents of human rights take, and the other is that they oppose equal treatment because they love rights and freedoms. They love their own. They love free speech. They love free speech. They hate the youngsters with the so-called cancel culture online, but they want to lock up protesters. And this isn't just a point about British politics. As Connor and others said earlier, this is um, this is an international phenomenon at this moment with hard 
hard right in particular, but not just right, hard men, mostly men, not, you know, there's, there's that nice lady in Italy, um, um, you know, so, it, so it's, it, it's not just a male phenomenon, but it's this hard machismo politics of notionally nationalist and not for equal treatment, but they want free speech, they want fair trials, uh, they want property rights, they want pretty much everything but for themselves, people like them, their friends and family, their chums, and whoever is in the privileged class at that moment. They want rights and freedoms that the political community can give and take away almost in a heartbeat. And this is something that our wonderful friend Tom Bingham understood very well, even when he was writing The Rule of Law um, uh, the, the, those some years some years ago now so 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 my suggestion is that to as shauna indicated to deal with um this uh this politics of hate and far-right populism to deal with grave and increasing inequality especially coming out of the pandemic goodness me wasn't the pandemic a para a parable for every injustice on the planet including the great good fortune that, that some of us had in having vaccines so early on. Um, but, but even with all the emergency interventions, including suspensions of rights and freedoms that I supported, unlike certain distinguished uh, uh, people, including former Supreme Court judges who thought the elderly should shield themselves and we should let the, um, the uh, virus rip through the population. I did actually, with a heavy heart, support uh, lockdowns. I thought the first lockdown should have come sooner. And, and I did that. I took that responsibility and supported that on the basis of equal treatment. And we don't leave anyone behind. Human rights folk do not let a virus rip through the population and let the elderly take their time because they've had their time. That might be a right wing libertarian proposition. It is not a human rights proposition. But equally, when we did temporarily suspend so many fundamental rights and freedoms why didn't we temporarily waive patents on vaccines why did we witness the obscenity of dead bodies floating down the ganges river whilst the serum institute of india produced vaccines to be exported to to, to britain and the west so um, equal treatment needs to be better delivered, not just in the civil and political sphere, I would argue, but in the social and economic sphere too. And you find it in the social and economic rights, which we haven't touched on, which are important in, in the settlement. They may, may have always been intended for progressive development, but so was, the, so was the abolition of the death penalty. So sometimes I think that the absolute or qualified nature of rights and freedoms is almost more important than their denomination as, as civil and political or social and economic. But, but, but as has been indicated on this panel, we cannot, we cannot deal with matters of war and peace. We cannot begin to deal with the new ungoverned continent of the internet, let alone what's coming our way with AI. And we certainly can't deal with the climate emergency in any sensible way without more global governance. And we need to build on the rights and freedoms that we already have. And probably, and I was always of the stick not twist variety of human rights person for fear of opening up conventions to be undermined. But I think in, in some of these areas, we do now have to ha have to build and not just stick where we are. And interestingly, this is acknowledged even by members of the current government who are holding summit, summits about AI and going to give speeches in Reykjavik and so on, it is on the one hand understood that more global governance and greater regulation and cooperation is required. So that is said, you know, out of one from one side of your mouth, and then the next minute there's a tough talk about what follows from stopping the boats, stopping the courts and and activist lawyers and so on. So the fact that um, there is this this dichotomy and and uh, um, and people are saying contradictory things, opponents of rights and freedoms are saying contradictory things, does probably indicate that we are that we are right. And I think that we need to remember it wasn't so easy back in the day after after World War II. That wasn't some halcyon period, and we've got it tough now. Um, you know, nationalism and imperialism and, and the, the, the wicked ideology of racial supremacy had delivered not one but two global conflicts. 
and and people were coming through that very difficult time and the difference between then and now to some extent was statecraft and i believe that we can rise to that to that level of optimism ambition and statecraft um, once more and i think the universal declaration and some of the, the regional treaties are the greatest achievements in statecraft and if that generation could 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 deliver that um i have i have huge ambitions for perhaps my generation i'm 54 we've sort of screwed up quite quite roundly but but you know i can be a comeback queen too you know we can all be resurrected and 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 so on if you know if if president trump's going to be present again you know goodness me um at least at, at least elder persons uh, equality is 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 on the agenda if it um if, if if nothing else but i do have high hopes for a younger a younger generation who have lived through the tumultuous period of the last decade and longer and i think armed with what we have and the challenges that we face the values that we that we cherish there's there's there's, there's a lot more um positive stuff to come and i'll leave it there Thank you so much, Sammy. Um, I realize we are encroaching on your tea and coffee time, but um, if we can quickly just take a question or two, since we didn't get the chance in the last panel either. So if there are any, yes, please. Hi, I'm Connor, Connor Morgan, 5 Essex Chambers. Could I just ask about special advocates? Oh, thank you so much. Hi, I'm Connor Morgan, 5 Essex Chambers. Could I just ask you about special advocates? Because there's several people that have done cases involving them. Um, what's your view of the current regime and in particular Angus McCulloch's um, KC's criticism of the current regime? Just to briefly explain to some people, some people in the audience what it is. Um, basically, if the state has irrelevant material, um, which it doesn't want to put in the public domain, it is possible to appoint an advocate to represent the interest of somebody. And it obviously raises very serious ECHR issues and open justice issues. Um, and the government, in some people's view, has failed to respond to that challenge. Hmm. I was quite closely involved when the Justice and Security Act came in. Shami's involvement goes back actually much earlier with the invention of the system. Uh, I've got a lot of time for Angus McCulloch. I think he's a very thoughtful man. He's somebody who felt he could work with the system because on balance, although it was an imperfect approximation to justice, it was capable of producing more justice than the alternative and what we'd had before. I agree with what the special advocates said in their submission to the statutory inquiry. Uh, the statutory inquiry, generally speaking, agreed with what they said. The scandal is that the Ministry of Justice still hasn't responded to a statutory inquiry that should have been completed in 2019. Because of their delay, it wasn't completed until 2021. And in late 2023, we're still waiting uh, for these things to be done. Angus has done the principled thing of saying he's not going to take any more special advocate cases, and I can't say I blame him. Uh, to plead, to plead guilty to, to David's um, very fair, very fair uh, charge that as a young lawyer in the Home Office back in, 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 in 96 and 97, I, I worked on the Special Immigration Appeals Commission Bill then Act that, that started, that set up the whole regime in response to the Chahal um, decision. And you know what, what the attempt was to try and square this circle between national security and, and due process. And goodness me, I had no idea um, that something that was so exceptional to give some kind of due process to people who would otherwise be sent to places with no, you know, with what, a few good chaps in the House of Lords um, having lunch and rubber stamping Home Office's decisions. I had no idea that the cancer of so-called secret justice, which is basically an oxymoron, isn't it? Secret justice is to a large extent an oxymoron that the cancer <laughs> would spread and be applied um, uh, you know, to, to so many area, areas of law. And so 
Um, and so I have to praise the, you know, the special advocates for, you know, just like military lawyers in, in during the war on terror in, in, in the US and elsewhere did ultimately say, yes, we, we, we do this. We are patriots. We understand the challenges of national security in difficult times, but we are lawyers and we stand up for the rule of law. So so credit to the special advocates and, 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 and credit to all credit to all lawyers, whoever their client is, who will when push comes to shove speak up for the rule of law. And one more question. Sorry, right in the back row. Oh, Sue. Um, my name is Sue Wilman. I'm a solicitor at Dighton Pierce Glynn and in the legal clinic at King's College. Touching on the point that Shami made about amending existing treaties to bring them up to date, the Council of Europe's got a proposal at the moment to uh, amend or introduce a new protocol um, to the European Convention to introduce a right to healthy environment. Uh, at the same time, the Grand Chamber's just recently been listening to um, the Duarte Agostina and a couple of other cases um, about uh, whether Article 8 and the right to life can be adapted to um, introduce rights in relation to healthy environment. So I just wondered what the panel thought was the better approach to try to use the living instrument doctrine or to uh, try to go through the rather painful process of negotiating uh, changes to our treaties to uh, introduce um, uh, rights to healthy environment and environmental rights. I think you have to do both and both and both is what people people will do in the in the absence of the kind of global leadership that i've been talking about and aspiring to um then 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 litigators and their clients and ngos and people affected all over the world will will litigate using what they have using a combination of uh, things like article 8 in some cases even using things like the right to life but combining combining uh, those uh, civil and political rights under under various regional treaties and domestic instruments with paris um and with um, and with whatever what, whatever is available and of course this has been beginning to happen globally with some success and there are now some very i think there's been i mean again, very disappointing election res result in the Netherlands yesterday, but there's been some very good um, climate litigation coming out of um, uh, the, the, the Netherlands and at the international level. And I think it's belt and braces, isn't it? And, you know, politicians that complain about lawyers and complain about the living instrument need to step up. Because if you don't step up and modernise um, and come up with new statecraft and new treaties yourself, or, or or amend what there is, then then don't be surprised when um when, you know if if you don't reach out yourself, other people will in your eyes overreach. But the but the, the scale of the emergency is too great for any complacency, and people will do will do what they can with ingenuity and creativity. I have no doubt. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. Both, I mean, living instrument. I think the opponents of living instrument have to ask um, what the alternative is, and you you end up with a sort of Scalia type originalism, living tree. It's a common law doctrine. It's obvious. Um, uh, the the Strasbourg Court has been um, very effective, and I, I in in developing its case law along principled lines, applying uh, Article Thirty One to Thirty Two VCLT. Uh, uh, with a bit of, you know, special character, human rights treaty and practical and effect thrown in. So, uh, absolutely. Um, I echo both what Shami and Raza say. Uh, and just to give you just a slight sort of expansion on that from another perspective, uh, I do quite a lot of work on AI and equality and human rights. And many of us have been saying for years that we need laws and treaties to get ahead of the game. And they've just been completely not forthcoming. Well, they're beginning to be in certain jurisdictions, but they aren't here. So what are you supposed to do while the world races ahead? You've got to try and do both. And actually the, the example of the Glukin case that I, that, that one of the reasons I think it's so important is because actually it's trying to look at the balancing exercise and the pros and cons that you see in guidelines, et cetera, that have been emerging for years, including the UN high commissioners. 
but tr but and trying to use it in a responsible way that recognizes the real life situation that we're all in and i think exactly the same about the environment we need the living instrument doctrine. I tried to use it myself in an environmental case about night flights at Heathrow. We briefly persuaded the Court of Human Rights to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to help us, but the Grand Chamber took another view. My only difference of emphasis with the other panellists would be that, important though that is, it is much, much better if you can get the states to agree specifically to it. And I think part of the problem we're seeing with Rule 39, not only in the UK, but in the Polish courts and in other courts all over Europe, is that they say, we never signed up to this. Now, you and I can say any mature legal system must have interim relief to preserve the object of the claim. And, and English judges invented Moreva injunctions. But the lack of that democratically endorsed approval by the states is the cause of the difficulties of Rule 39. And that's why I think it'd be much, much better uh, to get it in a treaty or protocol if we possibly can. Thank you so much to all our speakers and uh, apologies again, we are running a bit over time. So if we can take about 10 minutes then for tea and coffee, people could just grab something, uh, make your way to your seats and then we can start again in about 10 minutes. Thank you so much.